Hey, yesterday I, uh, I had an interesting day. I did a wedding for a young uh, Sikh, uh, Christian Sikh couple that have been coming to our church. They're moving to Lathrop, and, but the wedding was in Turlock where all of their family is. And so uh, I wasn't quite sure how this was going to go because I'm doing a Christian marriage ceremony and I've got 300 Sikhs in the audience. And so that was an interesting adventure. And, uh, but as I got to know some of them, I found out, one, they are very community-minded and they're very family-oriented. And uh, I had a good time talking to a lot of them. Uh, they were open. I didn't have anybody come up to me afterwards and uh, even dispute anything that I had to say. And fortunately, I was with a, uh, a Sikh, uh, a Christian Sikh a guy, and, and he, he took me through the food line because uh, all the food that was in the buffet line had all these names on there that I did not recognize, and I didn't know what in the world I was going to eat. And so he said, he said, well, Jim, this is this, and this is this. Oh, you don't want to eat that. <laughs> and so I'm going, whoo, that's a good thing. So I had a great time yesterday, and, uh, uh, you know, they go all out. I mean, a wedding there is, is a four- or five-hour deal. Everybody is just dressed to the hilt, and uh, the women just look so beautiful with their sorry gowns on and all the makeup and their hair, and the men are all wearing suits and tuxes, and, and uh, it, was, it was quite a day. So, uh, But again, they, um, they love their families, and uh, we're going to be talking about the family today. You know, as we look at the contented family, Exodus 20, verse 17 says, you shall not covet. You shall not covet. It's on your outlines there. And uh, uh, covet means the unconditional desire uh, to acquire, the uncontrolled, excuse me, desire to acquire. Uh, do you love to acquire things? I think we all do. But contentment means having a mind in a state of peace, having your mind in a state of peace, being satisfied in the state that I'm in, satisfied in the state that I'm in. Now, I'm going to do something that's very stereotypical. When you look at a woman's checkbook or her online purchases or whatever else, you're going to find a lot of little things that they buy, right? But you won't find the big ticket items, typically, right? This, I'm being stereotypical now. But if you look at what a man spends, he spends very little on all those little things, right? But he goes out and buys the boats and the, and the jet skis and the, the RVs and whatever else, right? That's typically how we look at things. And sometimes all of this causes conflict because we're not in agreement about our purchases. But uh, contentment, contentment, having a state of mind of peace, being satisfied to the state I'm in. I, uh, my bachelor's degree uh, uh, many years ago <laughs> was, uh, was in business and finance and economics. And one of the things that I learned very quickly is that the purpose of advertising is to uh, create uh, within you a desire for something that you need, that you don't have. It's to fulfill a need in your life. And so the purpose of any advertising is to get you to feel like you're discontent because you don't have whatever it is they're advertising. Isn't that true? And that's why we buy things. Why else would they spend billions of dollars on advertising if it didn't work? It works. You see it up there, you want it, you buy it. And that's the purpose of it. But there are several effects of always wanting more. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at three. There's possibly many more than this, but there's several effects of always wanting more. And then we're going to look at the secret of being content, how to be content in whatever circumstance you're in this morning. So the effects of always wanting more, the first one there is fatigue. Fatigue. It is wanting, you have to work more to acquire more. It's just that simple. You got to work more to acquire more. Now, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist or resist. A more a different translation says, Don't wear yourself out to be rich, but have the wisdom to show restraint. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Otherwise, you just work yourself to death. I met with a guy uh, last week uh, who's part of a large corporation. And if I said it, you'd know who it was. And uh, he had to meet with top management. They called him in for a meeting. And uh, basically, he, he, uh, you know, they, they don't care what your schedule is. When they call, they call. And you go. And uh, he said, though, that as he met with many members of the top management, every one of them were, were divorced. 
Everybody in top management was divorced. Why? Because they're married to their jobs, basically. He literally said that. They're married to their jobs. Their jobs come first. And uh, as a result of that, uh, it leads to fatigue, it leads to conflicts, and it leads a lot to a lot of other things. The second thing that can often happen when we're always wanting more is debt and worry. Debt and worry. They often go together. Because coveting destroys budgets. <laughs> coveting destroys your budgets. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied. Notice you, he who loves money. With money, nor will he who loves wealth. With his income, this is also vanity or pride. It's vanity or pride. You know, when we want to have more and more and more, it leads to pride, it leads to vanity, and we're never satisfied. No matter what we do, we're never satisfied. There's an old saying that goes like this. How much, how much do, you, do you need? How much does a man really need? And the answer to that is always just a what? A little bit more, right? If you ask anybody, are you satisfied with your income? Most people always say, I need just a little bit more. That's the way it is, isn't it? Um, I just don't make enough. But there's a difference between our wants and our needs. Our wants and our needs. And when our uh, wants uh, exceed our needs and our debts, our budgets get overblown, why it leads to worry and conflict, and uh, we become workaholics. And the third thing is, as I just mentioned, it leads to conflict. It leads to conflicts. Uh, the result of always wanting more, never being satisfied, that it leads to conflicts in our home, in our lives, in our budgets, and everything that we do. Notice what James says in 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He says, What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your pleasures, your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, why is crime so high? Why do people commit crime? Because they want something out there. They, you know, they, they want it. They're, they're going to take it. They, they want crime as high because people have, uh, they think that this is the way to achieve what they want in life, is just go out and get it. And often you're the victim of it. And then he says, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying to ask about these needs before you go out and do something about it. Ask God before you do something. And then he says, you ask sometimes and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, we ask God, God, <laughs> I'd really love this new uh, toy over here. But uh, uh, God's saying, you know what? You know, you need to get your passions and your, uh, and your wants and your needs all in order here before you just start asking away on wanting everything. And so it does lead to conflicts in the family. We know that because... Uh, we uh, are asking and doing what we should not be doing to get those things. Now, how do we learn contentment? How do we learn contentment? That's the secret there. Well, first of all, Christ said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever I need to learn in my life, I can do it through Christ. That's just bottom line, uh, bottom line teaching. But Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses, verse 12, that I have learned the what? I have learned the secret, first of all, of being content. And that's not on your notes. But I have learned the secret, the secret of being content. Now, is there a secret to being content? Well, sure, there's principles in Scripture that tell you how to be content. Paul says, I've learned that. I've learned that over my time, how to be content. In a second uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 10, verse 12, we're going to see that the first thing that we need to do in learning how to be content is to resist comparing. Resist comparing yourself and your situation with others. Let's read the verse. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another, when they measure themselves by one another, and compare themselves with one another, they're without understanding. So what is he saying here? If you compare yourself with others, you are without understanding. Now what does that mean? 
<laughs> it means you're stupid, you're dumb. When you compare yourself with other people, that's a dumb thing to do. It's a dumb thing to keep comparing yourself to others. Do you do that when you go into somebody's home? Do you? You know? Now, if you come to my home, I've got an 86 inch TV. So, there. I had to buy it because of my wife's eyesight. And um, <laughs> it's true. And, uh, and uh, you know, for a man, there's never such a thing as too large of a TV. You know that, right? So, so uh, people come to my house and say, wow, you know, Jim, how you. And I said, hey, look, you know, that's, um, but what do you do when you go into other people's homes? You know, do you compare what they have to what you have? How about cars? Do you compare your car, your vehicle to somebody else's? Look what they're driving. Oh, man, I wish I had that. And, uh, you know, I know somebody that went out and bought a $90,000 BMW, and, and I got in it, and, you know, all these lights change. It's got all this mood lighting in it. It's got this huge screen. <laughs> It's got more electronics. It has so much electronics that it has to have two batteries, two car batteries, in order to run all the electronics. Did that make me jealous? Nah. I just got into my little Nissan pickup, and I was, I was content, you know. So what about kids? Do they compare? How about the first day of school? Do the kids compare what their other students are wearing or the shoes they bought or whatever? How about clothes? Do you ever look at anybody else's clothes and say, wow, wow, are they really dressed sharp? I wish I could do that, you know. You know, we all look around and we compare ourselves. And when we compare ourselves with what others have, it leads to covetousness, it leads to greed, it leads to jealousy, uh, dissatisfaction in life, and it leads then to quarrels and arguments because we don't have what they have. You know, why can't you make enough to do this? Why, why don't you do this? Why, why, why can't I have this like these other kids have? And that's what it leads to when we compare ourselves. So don't compare yourselves. In fact, Paul says it's really dumb to do that. That's not what it's all about. Also, it leads to fights, as we've just talked about. But um, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10, and I'll read this to you. But godliness with contentment, with contentment, is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. We will be content. We should be content, right? If you look around the world and you realize uh, the position of the people in the United States compared to the rest of the world, we're way up there, right? We're way up there in that top 5%. But if we have food and clothing we, with these, we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich, to be rich, it's a desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For money is the root of all evil. Is that what it says? For money is the root of all evil? No, what does it say? The love, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many a pang. Now the question is, is it okay to be rich? Yes, it is. You know what? God loves rich people. He uses rich people. He uses their finances to finance ministries and, and different things around the world. There's nothing wrong with having assets or money. It's the desire and how you got there and, the, and, and what you do with it that makes the difference. It's the love of money. In other words, if that's all your motivation is, is to be rich, then he says you have the wrong attitude because you're going to do anything it takes to get there. And that may be destructive to your family and to everyone else around you. It's the love of money, again. Secondly, he says here, rejoice. Rejoice in what I do have. The next thing is rejoice in what you do have. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now let's go over that again. Give thanks in what? All circumstances, yeah, when the car breaks down, yeah, when you have a health issue, yeah, when you, when you lose your job or you don't get the promotion or, or things go south or when uh, the stock market takes a dip, you know, uh, I make the mistake, I watch it every day, I mean, you know, I, I have a, like I said, I have a degree in business and, and uh, I, I, I watch the stock market, I shouldn't do that though. Because, you know, all of a sudden, oh, man, look at that. It dropped 500 points today because of this. And then, and then the, you know, then it goes back up, and the feds are going to cut rates. So now it's up at almost an all-time high. And so I'm going, yeah, 
you know, and all this, but give thanks in all circumstances because everything is fleeting. Anything can be taken away in a moment, in a moment. The question is, what would you do or what would it take for you to be happy or content? What's it going to take you to make you content, you know? What are you waiting for? You know, well, if only I had this, uh, or if only I had this person, um, if only I had these looks, you know, maybe I should get some uh, plastic surgery or, or whatever, you know, so uh, wh whatever. If only I had this, you know, uh, I, would, I would be more content. Folks, you got to learn to be content in whatever circumstance you're in. And I remember when I was going to seminary um, that I had a roommate, and uh, he and I were both poor. I was driving an old Ford Pinto, you know, the kind that when they crashed into the rear, they blew up, you know. <laughs> and I had somebody that crashed into the rear of my Pinto, and it didn't blow up, which was really great. <laughs> my roommate had this old beat-up square Studebaker. The thing was ugly as all get out. And, uh, but, you know, we were working at uh, part-time jobs, custodians at night to make it through uh, graduate school, seminary. It took four years, and, you know, it's a lot of money. But um, so we were looking for any way, to, any way we could to save a dime. And uh, if you're familiar with Ralph's Supermarkets, well, Ralph's Supermarkets in Southern California at that time used to have bins in the store of cans with no labels. Cans with no labels. Now, they don't do this anymore, but they had all these cans there in great big bins that you could buy for five cents a can. So for a dollar, you could buy 20 cans of food. And so we would do this. We'd come back with all these bags full of cans. We had no idea what's in them. See, every night at dinner, was a, it was a treat. Every night, what are we going to have tonight, Roger? And so I come home one day from, uh, from school, and uh, Roger's uh, cooking something on the stove. And he says, Jim, I don't know what I'm cooking here. I said, would you come over and look at this and, and, and see what I'm cooking? <laughs> I said, Roger, you're cooking dog food. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway so did I learn how to be content yeah I did even when uh, the meals that night were not very good so and by the way we didn't eat the dog food but but uh, you know um, you know depending on your situa situation in life we often focus on what we don't have what we don't have right if you don't have kids you focus on not having kids if you do have kids and they're acting badly, you focus on that. <laughs> you know, if you don't have a spouse, you want a spouse. And then sometimes you have a spouse. You're focusing on what's wrong with her, that spouse, you know. <laughs> uh, or education. I wish I had more education. I wish I had a degree. I wish I had this. Or my advancement in career. Well, it didn't happen. The boss doesn't like me. There's other issues. My company got bought out. My company's changing. Uh, or if you didn't make the grades, you know, uh, I was a terrible student uh, all the way through school until I eventually got to college and then I went on and went on to graduate school and so forth. But uh, I was always jealous of all those people that, that were made better grades. And I blame it on my mom because she put me in, in kindergarten at four years old. And so I was always behind, you know, so I blame it on my mom. But, you know, in my high school, uh, I went to a fairly uh, well-to-do high school, so to speak. I have my a 30th reunion in a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's actually, <coughs> actually my 55th, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm on the committee. And uh, we had a very tight-knit school and uh, because uh, it's just one, one junior high, one senior high, everybody knew everybody, you know. But in my high school, if you didn't have a car, you were nobody. I mean, you were nobody. Nobody looked at you. The girls they wouldn't even pay attention to you until you got a car. So I worked real hard mowing lawns. I worked like crazy until I got my car. When I got my 62 Chevy, you know, all of a sudden the girls looked at me. You know, I was somebody. I was somebody. You know, that made the difference in my life. You know, I, I, I just felt so much more content when I had a car. Well, we do that all the time, though, too, don't we? We look at things and say, man, if I only had that, if I had this, I, I'd be so content in life. But uh, it doesn't always work out that way. So rejoice in what we do have. We have to rejoice in what we do have. And uh, my friend down here often says uh, on his Facebook page, hey, it's another day above ground. He puts that, it's another day above ground. Well, that is being content, you know? It's one more day above ground, you know? I went to a funeral uh, just recently, and uh, the gal next to me said, you know, every day's a gift, isn't it? I said, every day's a gift, every day's a gift. Next, release what you do have to help others. Part of being content is to be able to release what you do have to help others. 
Acts, <clears throat> excuse me, Acts 20, verse 35 says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive there at the end of that verse. When you give, it takes the focus off of your circumstances and it puts it on others, doesn't it? When you give, it takes the focus off of you and puts it on others. Notice what uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 uh, says about this. <clears throat> As for the rich man in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. They are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. When you help others, he says, God does something in your life, and it, it changes you when you help others. But when you just hoard it, you become a Scrooge, and you take it all for yourself, uh, God says that's, that's the way you're going to live. But when you give out to others, something happens in your life, and God blesses you in ways in which you uh, never thought was possible. And you know what? We live in very uncertain times. Anything can happen. All you have to do is turn on the news. There's wars. There's hurricanes. There's floods. There's tornadoes. There's wildfires. There's economic changes. How about the election uncertainty that's about ready to happen here? You know, all kinds of things. And then what is he saying here? Don't hold on to these things too tightly. Don't grab onto them too tightly. They can be gone in an instant. But we live in a very materialistic world, a very greedy world, and uh, we don't get caught up in it is what, what he's saying here. Don't get caught up in it. It ruins lives. It ruins families. He says, uh, he says uh, uh, focus on, on the right things here, and that is the last thing. Refocus on what's going to last. Focus on what's going to last. And you know what's going to last? It's going to be people. People are going to last. Things are going to, are going to rust and rot and go away, but people are going to last. We need to focus on relationships. Relationships. When I went to a funeral, I did a funeral last Saturday in Lodi, and um, the person that passed, and uh, they have connections here at our church and come here, and uh, the, the, the testimonies and the eulogies were just amazing. I mean, the person has such a legacy because of their Christian faith and what they've done in, in people's lives and how they've helped people's lives. And uh, I looked around, and it wasn't anything about their assets. It was all about the legacy they left behind. And that room was filled with the legacy of how that person has influenced so many other people. That's what it's all about. You know, how many people on their deathbeds say, uh, uh, you know, could you please call in my accountant? I want to go over that last transaction. Uh, call in my stockbroker. I want to make sure we do make the right, right uh, uh, decision here before I, before I go. No. What do they want? They want family around them. You know, because that's what's important. It's relationships. It's not assets. It's not all those things. Those things are all going to flee and, and, and vanish, and you're going to give it away to somebody else. <laughs> so, um, so he says here, uh, leave a legacy behind. Uh, give to bless others, and God in turn will bless you. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses uh, 6 and 7, the point is this, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And if, you don't, you know, if that's what you want to do in life, you want to give it out cheaply, sparingly, hardly help anybody, hardly give anything away that God's given you, whether it's in your time or your talents or your treasures, then that's what you're going to get back. God says, that's the, that's the way I'm going to reward you. If that's the way you want to give it out, that's what you're going to get back. But he says, notice also that uh, whoever sows bountifully, bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he decided in his heart. So it's a hard issue, you know, about what you give with all your time and your talents and your treasures. And you need to give of all three. You know, some people are good at giving one thing, but they don't do anything with the others. You know, God wants us to give out of everything that he's given us. He's given us time. He's given us talents, abilities, skills, whatever else. And he's given us treasures. He's given us finances and assets to use to help others and to help his ministry. Each one must give out as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly, not reluctantly, oh, I have to do this, I've got to give this, or under compulsion, but because God loves what? 
A cheerful giver. You know, if you can't give it cheerfully, don't give it, you know, because all you're doing is just, you know, you're thinking you're going to earn some brownie points or something if you just give it away that way. And God is able to what? Make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. In other words, uh, don't be a Scrooge. Don't be a Scrooge. God wants all of us to give all of our time, talents, and treasures. You see, he gives us, uh, because that gives us contentment, because we're not holding on to everything so tightly. The joy comes as we give, as we give. And whether you give to this ministry and other ministries, uh, uh, whatever else, God will bless you for it. I learned one thing a long time ago, is that you can't outgive God. And uh, I, t- I had a wise man took me aside when I was in my 20s, and he said, um, hey, Jim, you'll never be able to outgive God, so start now in developing a plan to give, to give away what God gives you. And he says, when, you're, when I'm uh, old and gone, you'll be singing my praises, and I have been uh, all this time because uh, I learned the secret of, of uh, giving uh, out of what God gives me. God does something when we give. As I mentioned, he gives us peace. He gives us love. He gives us contentment. And it comes as we give. And as you give, God blesses you. He doesn't necessarily give you a dollar back for a dollar. Oh, I gave a dollar today. God, now I expect a dollar back. Or uh, God, I'm going to work here, so I automatically expect this to happen. No, but over a lifetime, God blesses you. And I can see that over my life. It hasn't always been because I've done this or done that that God blessed me in the next two months or something. But over a lifetime, God has blessed me. And I can give you countless examples of how that has happened. But that's where faith comes in. It comes in. You know, anytime you give of your time or your talents or your treasures, it's all by faith. You know, God, here it is. Use me. And you may not see the results right away, but God will, over time, bless you because he's good to, he's, he's good to his word. If he says he'll do it, he'll do it. You know, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. If you sow sparingly, well, that's what you're going to get to. So it all comes down to faith. God, it's yours. It all comes from you. I give it all to you. After all, who gave you the ability to do it? Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you the resources to do it? Who gave you the education? Who gave you the opportunities in life that you have? God did. And so it's just, it's just on loan. That's all it is. It's just on, on loan to us. And uh, we're to use it for him. So what I'd like to do, I'd like us to pray and, and uh, uh, just that we have the right attitude in all these things uh, because uh, uh, without that right attitude, you're going to have conflict. And uh, it's going to be in your family. It's going to be in your kids. It's going to follow from generation to generation. And um, I met with um, my financial advisor uh, not too long ago. And, uh, you know, he says, Jim, you're at that age now where you need to decide what you're going to do with all your money. And uh, he says, because I get lots of people in here in my office, they're in their 70s now, and they're sitting on all this money. And uh, they don't know what to do with it because there are some of them that are at odds with some of their kids. They don't want to give it to them. Some of their kids are very successful. They don't even need it. And uh, they said, uh, you know, uh, God has blessed you because you've honored him. Now, what are you going to do with it? And uh, that was a real stark question that I had to answer. So uh, I've had to and hopefully will make changes in my life as a result.